Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we are talking uranium, its supply chain, its market, and where prices are headed in a much more volatile world, and how the West will guarantee its security of supply. Our guest is John Cash, CEO of Urenergy, an active in situ uranium miner based in Wyoming that's been in production for 10 years, and with that production set to grow. As always, you can really support the podcast by leaving us a positive review on the platform you're listening on. It really does support us. And as always, I hope you enjoy the episode. John, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks, Paul. It's great to be on. Certainly is a great time to be talking about nuclear in the uranium space. Exactly. And I'm looking forward to having this discussion. We are talking about uranium, its supply chain, the market for it, and its position in a in a, a more volatile world today and in a world that's facing energy transition. Let's get us all on the same page. What do we mean by uranium? What is it? And kind of what are the definitions that we might be using as we go through this discussion? Yeah, uranium is, uh, of course, uh, one of the elements on the periodic table. It does come in different isotopes, uh, 234, 235, and 238. Uh, Typically, the one that industry is interested in is the uranium-235 isotope because it can sustain a nuclear fission reaction. And that allows it to be used for uh, energy generation uh, by utilities globally. Right now, there are about 436 nuclear power reactors operating around the world producing carbon-free electricity. And uranium is the sole fuel for those reactors uh, currently. It's, of course, also used for uh, Navy propulsion uh, for those nuclear vessels that uh, are utilized around the world. And, of course, uh, also for weapons. But when it comes to defense, that is a very, very small percentage of the overall market for uranium. The vast majority of uranium that is mined today is burned in nuclear reactors for electric generation. So that's what uranium is and, and what it's used for. Great. And of course, it's it's that overlap with defense that introduces a lot of the controls and restrictions that we're going to go on to talk about. So whilst it's a small percentage, it a, has a profound impact on the supply chain. What yeah. What is, in its most basic terms, the supply chain for uranium? How does it go from mine to reactor? Yeah, you bet. There are a number of steps involved. And each of these steps adds a layer of complexity. It does get involved into the geopolitics because there are a number of governments involved. Uh, So it starts off with uranium mining. And some of the mining, about half of the mining, uh, the uranium is recovered using very conventional techniques. For example, open pit mines or underground mines that uh, when I say mining, it's exactly what you would envision. Roughly the other half, though, globally is produced using in situ technology or solution mining, where miners inject a luxivient or a mining solution into the ore body that dissolves it underground and it's pumped to the surface. So that technology has been around since the uh, very early 1960s, but it is becoming more and more prevalent for uranium recovery. But once the uranium is recovered, most of the miners produce what's called yellow cake. You hear about that in the news a lot, but that is not something that can be burned in a reactor because that is uranium in its natural state of isotopic uh, uh, ratios. And really there needs to be more uranium-235 and less uranium-238. So to get to that process, the next step is conversion. And there are a handful of facilities globally that will take the uh, yellow cake which is a uranyl peroxide or uranyl oxide, and convert it to uranium hexafluoride. That is a chemical process. From there, it needs to go to an enrichment facility. Again, because we need a higher ratio of the uranium-235 isotope compared to the uranium-234 and 238. If you don't have a higher concentration of uranium-235, it won't be able to sustain that reaction when it goes into the nuclear power plant. So you've got to get that ratio higher, typically pushing 5% ratio of uh, uranium-235. So enrichment is really the uh, the highly complicated, expensive, time-consuming, physical separation 
of that uranium-235. There are literally just a handful of companies and state enterprises around the world that have the technical know-how and the uh, infrastructure to be able to do that. And so uh, from conversion, it goes to enrichment. They enrich it in that 235 isotope. From there, it's going to go on to uh, fuel fabrication where they actually make the little pellets that go into the reactor. And that's a physical process. But again, there are a number of steps there along the way. Away. I've described the major steps from mining all the way to the generation of a fuel pellet that can then be placed into a reactor. And Paul, I should comment too about who's doing this. Yeah. Uranium miners, there are not very many uranium miners around the world. Most uranium mining occurs in Kazakhstan. That is largely owned and controlled by a state-owned entity called Kazatom Prom, and they produce nearly half of the world's uranium there. Uh, you also have production a little bit out of uh, some of the African countries. Pretty good production right now coming out of Australia. One of the major producers is Cameco out of Canada. Uh, they are probably the largest purely publicly traded uranium miner out there, certainly a quality name in the space. Then you have a little bit of production coming online in the U.S., including from my company, UR Energy. But it's worth noting that the majority of global production from mines is controlled by state-owned entities, not by publicly traded companies. So that adds to the geopolitics. Yeah, and the complexity around that. Just just staying on that supply chain for a moment, just so we're all on the same page or I'm on the same page. Is it yellow cake or is it the uranium urinal hexafluoride that's sort of the what's the main sort of traded commodity? What we, when we talk about uranium concentrate, what are we talking about there exactly? Is that where the sort of and we're gonna talk trading later, but is that the sort of the 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 commodity that exchanges hands? And as you sort of go towards that enrichment piece, at what point does this stuff start to become highly controlled by governments and so forth? Right. No. So the most of your uranium is traded as yellow cake. However, it can be traded as uranium hexafluoride or enriched product. Most utilities, though, they like to buy the yellow cake, the physical inventory, and then they buy the services of conversion and enrichment to uh, get their product. But again, there are exceptions to that. There are a number of utilities that like to buy enriched product at the very end so they don't have to mess with the uh, earlier two stages. So it's quite diverse. Every utility is a, is a, uh, a little bit different. But uranium uh, in the form of yellow cake or mine product is probably the most commonly uh, purchased and traded commodity in the fuel chain. It's worth noting that it is a very opaque market. Unlike copper or gold, where there are open trading markets uh, with uranium, especially historically, it's been very opaque. For example, when we sign a contract with a utility, we have an NDA with them that we are not able to disclose who we traded with and other restrictions on the, uh, the characteristics of that contract. So that does not make it to a public venue where that's shared with investors. That's changed a little bit uh, recently with the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. They're out buying pounds and they do disclose what they're buying on the spot market and the pricing related to that. So we are beginning to see a little bit more transparency in the market. But historically, it's been very opaque and hard to know who's trading and at what pricing. Yeah, There are uh, some publications that put out pricing, but they are not highly precise. They are more estimations than they are actual. Uh, defensible statistical analyses of, of actual trades. Yeah. How much vertical integration is there? Are there miners out there that take it all the way up to enrichment? Are there utilities out there, I guess, within these state-owned organizations that, that capture the whole supply chain? Or is it very segmented between those the, the miners, the processors, and the, and the final enrichment and usage piece? Yeah. So there is some integration. Um, there are a lot of just pure play uranium miners globally. For example, Kaz Adam Prom it would be one and uh, out of Uzbekistan, certainly in the U.S. That's the case where they are pure play uranium miners. Uh, it's also true out of Australia. But there are some notable uh, integrated uh, suppliers out there. Cameco is one. Arano is another. Cameco, again, is publicly traded, but they do the conversion and they are moving into enrichment with some technology that they're involved with. 
also they've uh, had a significant investment into Westinghouse, so they are moving into the reactor business as well. Arano is owned by the French government. Historically, they've been heavily involved with pretty much every stage of the fuel cycle. So those are two very notable exceptions. And then Russia can't really have a conversation about uranium without talking about Russia. But Russia has several state-owned entities that are involved in mining, conversion, and enrichment. So it is a mixed bag, uh, but it does involve some uh, very large companies and typically government-owned companies, uh, especially when you, it gets to uh, Russia. And there are, we should just put a pin in this, there are some independent traders as well. The trading houses or some of them are also involved in trading uranium. Yeah, there are a number of traders out there. Uh, some you know famous names that trade in a you know wide breadth of commodities. Uh, a lot of them trade in uranium as well. So there is a very active trade out there, uh, especially in the spot market. Right. Okay. Well, let's get to the market history. I'm sh- I'm sure by this point we've all seen Oppenheimer, but can you just I guess take us back to the beginning of the of the market for uranium and the the industry and kind of how understand how that story has evolved to the where we get to the market today because it is a very complex picture involving governments geopolitics and obviously defense and so forth yeah it is complicated and uh, we could talk about that for hours Uh, books can be written about it but obviously the technology uh, for nuclear power got started in the u.s and then very shortly thereafter in russia of course uh, in europe that expanded in france and england very very quickly thereafter So initially, the mining, uh, there was a lot of mining in the U.S. uh, in early years, uh, mining up in Canada in early years, uh, some in Australia, really none out of uh, Central Asia. And that's worth noting because now they are the dominant player when it comes to mining. Uh, But so, yeah, it started uh, there as well as in Russia, mining there. Pretty much everybody stuck to their knitting. Everybody had their own uh, supply chain domestically. Uh, early on. That began to change and evolve. Uh, The U.S. began to import more and more uranium from Russia and Russian entities. That really in the early 90s when uh, the Soviet Union dissolved, that had a major impact on the global market because Russia had a lot of nuclear weapons at that time, tens of thousands, and people don't realize that, tens of thousands of nuclear warheads, and the U.S. was interested in getting those out of the hands of Russia, making sure that that material was controlled. And Russia needed cash. So uh, an arrangement was made whereby the U.S. would actually buy those nuclear warheads and downblend them into nuclear fuel to be burned in reactors in the U.S. So for a number of years, post the, the early 90s and the breakup of the Soviet Union, a significant portion of nuclear power in the U.S. was fueled by warheads from the Soviet Union. Wow. And that's great. No one's complaining about that. That was the right thing to do. Uh, but it did have a profound impact on Western mining companies because you can't compete with that. So we saw a lot of imports coming in from those warheads. Production uh, from Western suppliers declined. And the Russians saw a business opportunity there. They essentially captured uh, the U.S. market, and the U.S. market was the largest and is still the largest nuclear fuel market in the world. No one has caught up with us uh, to this date. And so the Russians captured that market, and even when the uh, warhead supply ran out, they continued to dominate the market and to dump material into the U.S. market so that, in fact, the Department of Commerce got involved. Uh, said, hey, there's dumping here that can't continue. And uh, a Russian suspension agreement was signed that would limit the amount of uranium coming into the U.S. And it should note here, too, that another profound uh, occurrence was Kazakhstan. Back in the early 90s, the production of uranium there was negligent, uh, it was not relevant on the world stage. But over time, they have become a dominant player Uh, with in situ uranium mining. And like I said, they are now by far the world's largest producer of uranium and low cost uranium as well. And that has also had a major impact on all Western companies, not just in the US, but in Canada and Australia, their ability to compete. 
So what's happened is the Western world for a long time has been underfunded. Uh, there's not been much exploration, not much development. A lot of mines have been shut down. In fact, some of the highest quality mines in the world have been shut down because they can't compete with the state-owned enterprises out of Russia and Kazakhstan. But that's changing. There has been a significant supply gap because all that production has been off for so long. But now the world is recognizing, hey, the suppliers are not keeping up with demand from nuclear utilities. And it's a significant supply gap. And uh, that's the fundamental uh, driver in why the uranium price is climbing so quickly right now. But yeah, we could talk about that for hours, Paul, but those are kind of some of the major events that have been driving the market in the, you know, the, since the 1990s. Yeah, fascinating. And, you know, and there's analogy, analogous stories with, you know, other key and critical metals and how the West has lost a lot of its mining capability there, you know, through ultimately lower cost production from, from Asia, or in this case, the Central Asia. Yeah. So if we sort of put a pin in and say, I don't know, the mid 2000s, what is the state of the sector? Obviously, you've got, from a nuclear generation standpoint, Fukushima is yet to happen in Europe. There's still new reactors forecast. And obviously, we have China starting to build at a voracious rate mm. uh, nuclear generation. So who's supplying that? What sort of where are the, the rough flows of uranium going? And how at that point, how transparent was the market around pricing? And we've yet to hit sort of the what's about to start happening with a deglobalizing world and sanctions. But so sort of that mid 2000s, where, where are we at there? So Kaz Adam Prom out of Kazakh, their production is rapidly growing. They're becoming a, a dominant force uh, at that time. There's very little transparency in the global market because Sprott has not been even uh, formed yet as a uranium purchaser. Uh, a lot of that supply, uh, Western supply is still online. So you can look at companies like Cameco production there. The price of uranium spiked in 2007. Uh, spot market got up to about $136 a pound. So you had a lot of micro cap juniors because of the excitement jumping into the space. Virtually none of them survived. I could literally count on one hand the number that survived. And of those that survived that got into production, it's just a couple, including my company, UR Energy. But yeah, it was um, an exciting time. A lot of forecast for additional build out of reactors as we went into the you know 2005 through 2010 time period. Unfortunately, shortly thereafter, 2011, we had the Fukushima event that really took the wind out of the sails. So a lot of reactors around the world were canceled. There was kind of a reset. China did a reset as well. They had projected massive build outs of nuclear power. They took a breather. They reassessed the Japanese reactors. Of course, I believe there were 48. Those all went offline. So all of a sudden, all of this uh, existing demand at the time and projected demand uh, that was really, uh, you know, the a renaissance, if you will, in nuclear power uh, overnight, it, it really dissolved. And uh, it's taken a number of years for Japan to really begin to bring those reactors back online China to regain its footing and uh, to restart that massive build out of reactors. And uh, Paul, a lot of that growth that we're seeing right now, it's reality setting in that if we want to go to carbon free or carbon neutral, nuclear has got to be a part of the story. Uh, we need that base load energy that while wind and solar renewables are great, I'm not bashing them. But we have to be honest and recognize that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And so far, we don't have a good way to store that energy for those downtimes. So uh, COP28 that uh, just occurred, you had over 20 nations around the world say, we've got to go more toward nuclear. And they signed a commitment to triple nuclear power by 2050. And these are major countries. The, these are not the small third world nations. These are major first world nations that have signed on to that. And uh, so it's that carbon free angle that is really bringing nuclear power back into the forefront. And I'm sure we'll talk more about geopolitics, so I don't want to get too far ahead, <laughs> like over my skis here. But 
national security is another thing that is really driving the growth in nuclear power. Nations don't want to get natural gas from Russia anymore for obvious reasons. So those two factors are, really are driving the market as we come into the, uh, the near past. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe and the Americas and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. I mean, it does certainly feel that there has been a shift in the last year and a half or so to recognising nuclear's role. And obviously, there's a lot of hope about the fourth generation reactors that we've we've mm-hmm. covered elsewhere still using uranium, of course, just a different method of cooling. So before we get to today, tell us about, you know, the recent history of how uranium has been caught up in modern day geopolitics and geocompetition and and sanctions and so forth. And, And let's understand that story as well, because that's also, as you say, part of that security drive is obviously, as we're seeing with other critical metals, is rewiring to to friend shoring and to local production, and the old sort of you know the two thousands economics of it is really just about cost and logistics and production. That's really that equation has changed quite dramatically. But can you help us understand the history of where and how uranium is being caught up in sanctions? Yeah. So just a few years ago, you know, three, four, five, six years ago, the uranium market was very globalized. It was. Uh, you know, based on a capitalist system where uh, utilities would go out for an RFP to buy material and they would go global. They, there really was not much of a desire to uh, get homegrown resources. So it was put out that RFP to every miner in the world. Doesn't matter where it comes from or where it's processed for conversion and enrichment. The world was a friendlier place at that time and uh, security of supply for the utilities. Uh, I I won't say it was completely off their radar, but it was not a priority uh, like it is today. And then uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You really, it would be hard to overstate the impact of that uh, on the market. Again, because Russia is a major refiner, not miner, but refiner of uranium conversion and enrichment services. And many U.S. utilities were uh, heavily reliant on that conversion and enrichment out of Russia because it's very cheap. I mean, it's the Russian government doing it, and it's hard to compete with a government. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, I think a lot of the utilities were kind of like a deer caught in the headlights. They didn't know what to do. They were heavily reliant on that Russian supply. There was concern that there could be immediate sanctions to cut that off. And then the question is, if that gets cut off, where do we get our supply from? Where do we get our yellow cake? Where do we get our conversion? Where do we get our enrichment? And uh, quite frankly, the Western world does not have the capacity, certainly at that time, did not have the capacity to backfill that Russian supply should it be cut off. Now, that's slowly changing. Mining uh, is slowly, very slowly starting to pick up. Mines are being restarted. Conversion, uh, that capacity will be expanded. Announcements have been made on that. Similarly, on enrichment, announcements are being made there uh, looking to expand enrichment capacity. But it's been a slow process. As you can imagine, licensing and permitting of these facilities, mining, conversion, and enrichment, it all takes a lot of time. It doesn't happen overnight. And it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of expertise that quite frankly has disappeared in the Western world uh, simply because the industries have atrophied. And so all of that is having to be rebuilt and is thrown into question the supply. And that is really what is driving the prices uh, is because no one wants to rely on Russia anymore. So Mm. utilities are moving away from Russia. Slowly but surely, uh, we are still importing material from Russia into the U.S. Uh, believe it or not, uh, that uh, blows a lot of people away that we are importing Russian uh, nuclear material into the U.S. 
but I think that's ultimately going to change. Congress, uh, the House of Representatives in the U.S. has already voted in favor of sanctions to cut off that Russian supply. It is now up to the Senate to uh, review that legislation and decide whether to approve it or not. We do seem to have a lot of support from, from both sides of the political aisle to cut off that supply. But despite all of that support, that is not translated into actual action yet. And so that remains to be seen if Russian supply will be sanctioned or not. But that is the processing, the conversion and enrichment that really comes out of Russia that's so important. When we look at yellow cake, we have to look at Kazakhstan and Kazatom Prom, the state-owned entity there. They are the major supplier of mined material. They are our direct competitor. Russia has a lot of influence in Kazakhstan. Geopolitically, they have a lot of influence. They are a part of the uh, former Soviet satellite states. And also Russia has partial ownership in a number of the Kazakh mines. So if Russia is sanctioned, the question remains, what happens to Kazakh supply? Will it continue to flow into the Western world? Or will Russia take steps to cut that off? There's no doubt in my mind, and I'm not a geoscientist but a uh, politician, but I think there's, there's a pretty good likelihood that Vladimir Putin would attempt to control those uh, supplies flowing out of Kazakhstan to the Western world, and those would be diverted to Russia for their use, and importantly, to China. Kazakhstan is sandwiched between those two nations, and there's a lot of influence there. So if that happens, Overnight, that could have a significant impact on the global supply of yellow cake conversion and enrichment. And then one final comment on geopolitics and global supply is Niger. Niger is not a major player. They only supply about 4% of global supply uh, via Arano. Uh, they've got a mine there that's been operating for a long time. There are a couple of deposits there that companies are, are looking to develop in the future. So 4% doesn't sound like much, but 4% of supply in a stressed market, when you call that into question, that can have an impact on pricing. So when the coup occurred in Niger uh, some months ago and uh, brought into question that 4% of supply, that also had an impact on the price of uranium from uh, because output from existing mines got called into a question but also growth of the industry in Niger got called into question. So yeah, geopolitics, they are the tail that wags the dog when it comes to uranium supply. Yeah, and what's kind of fascinating is what uranium has essentially been dealing with for the long term, other commodities now are starting to have to deal with as well, right? The, the forecasting is, is across the board that much harder because of the instability, both in policy, but also in geopolitics, the, you know, it's really been the lifeblood of this this podcast. That's fascinating. Okay, so just out of interest, you know, couldn't we assume, therefore, that you know the USS Enterprise has Russian uranium in it? I mean, just, you know. oh yeah, a significant quantity right now. I think. Well, I think twenty twenty three uh, was a little over twenty percent of the uranium utilized in the U.S. industry was uh, from Russia. Yeah, and uh, if you take a look, and that's just Russia conversion and enrichment. If you take a look at the former Soviet satellite states, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, it grows dramatically beyond that 20%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they pulled the blinder with all the, uh, with the nuclear weapons piece, didn't they? Uh, they got someone else to clear it up yeah. for them yeah, and uh, killed off the industry. Okay. So just before we talk prices, are most utilities end users, are they operating under long-term supply contracts? When do they need to go to the spot market? How's that market structure work? Yeah. So, you know, utilities are well-known entities for being very stable, being very risk adverse. And I think it's really important for the listeners to, to understand that utilities typically don't buy much material in the spot market. The spot market is too volatile. It's too short term. Utilities are looking for long term, low risk stability. So therefore, they buy mostly in long term contracts. And long-term contracts represents roughly 85% of the entire uranium trade. The spot market is typically only about 15%. So 
a lot of people watch the spot market because it's a leading indicator. The pricing there is much more volatile, whereas the long-term market is much more moderated. It's slower to respond and it typically trails the spot market. So people get excited about the spot market. I get excited, you know, as CEO of a mining company, I get excited about the spot market. But the reality is most mining companies sell their pounds to utilities via long-term contracts, not the spot market. So it's really good to lay the table out there so the listeners understand where the purchasing comes from. And, and that's really where the utilities are right now, putting out RFPs, requests for proposals for long-term purchases of uranium. Mm -hmm. if, if a utility has to tap the spot market, there's a good chance it's because somebody didn't perform under a long-term contract and they're out there trying to backfill that uh, going forward. And those converters and enrichment specialists, do, do they participate in the market at all as well? You know, they, I mean, this is very facile, I know, but kind of, you know, they, they think prices are going up, so they, they're going to convert and enrich a bit more than, than necessary for the long-term contracts, or is that all very much controlled and tied to end users? They will dabble in the market, buying yellow cake and uh, you know applying the services and then selling it. But by and large, my understanding is they're more of a service provider where the utility brings them the product and then the converters and enrichers provide the surface. But there are certainly, I know of exceptions to that. And certainly the, some of the global players, when they see that there's a shortfall coming, and uh, they've got their finger on the pulse of the market, they will go out and buy material themselves. Uh, but typically, historically, that's not been the case. Right. Fascinating. OK, so the big question is, you've set out very plainly the the challenge right now the industry faces with looming sanctions on Russia, potentially, or even without those Russia deciding to, to use it as a lever and with considerable pressure on Kazakhstan as well. That could really crimp supply to the West. Is that priced in today? Because we, you know, we've had historically high prices for uranium in the recent past. It's very volatile at the moment. Like, can you just give us some sense of how all these things are playing into the price for yellow cake? Yeah, no, I think some of that is baked into the cake. I think uh, the uh, the more sophisticated institutional investors are very, very much aware of what's going on there and the negotiations and discussion uh, in Congress on that. So I think to uh, to a degree that is baked into the cake. I would say that if uh, Russian sanctions are applied tomorrow, and this is just a hypothetical, uh, we would probably see a jump in the uranium price. But do I see it tens of dollars a pound? No, I would see it as a few dollars, maybe $10 a pound. I don't want to overhype that because uh, I think it is baked in. But the caveat to that is Kazakhstan. If those sanctions are seen to be spilling over into Kazakh mine production and result in an inability for Kazakhstan to get those pounds to the West, then I would say Katie bar the door. We could see tens of dollars a pound overnight because Kazakhstan is such a dominant global player in the yellow cake production. So I don't think that's baked in to the price, nor do I think it should be baked into the price. But it is there is a risk there that uh, we have to watch for globally and be ready to respond uh, to uh, governments need to be ready to respond to that. Utilities need to be ready. And frankly, miners need to be ready to respond to that should it occur. Mm. I assume that that event would also be a, a positive for China as well, right? Because they would suddenly get a, a cheaper source yeah. of uranium, right? So. Right there's sort of this blockitization concept coming up, which is, you know, these sanctions are that double-edged sword that can have a profound effect and actually end up bolstering other geopolitical competitors. Yes. Yeah, no, that that's exactly right. You know, in the long term, in the next five to 10 years, we believe that regardless of sanctions, more and more of the production coming out of Kazakhstan will be going into Russia and into China and not to the West. So not in the near term, but in the mid to long term, uh, I think that supply from Kazakhstan is, is not coming West. And it's gonna be incumbent upon Western miners to replace that over the coming years. And that's gonna be a challenge uh, to be able to do that because the assets in Kazakhstan 
They are the tier one global assets. Outside of Kazakhstan, there are a few other tier one assets. But again, I can count them on one hand, quite literally. I'm not, I'm not just using that as a, <laughs> a, 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 a cute story. I, I can. I can count them on one hand, those tier one assets that are in the West. So it's going to be a challenge for the Western miners to uh, replace that supply, whether that's in the near term due to sanctions or whether that's in the long term simply because uh, the geopolitics dictate that the supply goes to China. Yeah. So there, there is a case, obviously, come what may, that with the perceived future demand for nuclear power, uh, alongside this sort of decoupling that's going on and you know, global demand drawing that uranium elsewhere, come what may, that the West needs to develop these assets. By tier one assets, do you mean actually just quality of deposits? And can you give us some sense of how long it takes to actually get these mines up and running? And I assume as well that these are... Um, as with the rest of this story around security of supply, you've got to overcome local policy, local pushback and so forth on the kind of the, the not in my backyard piece as well. Yeah. So, yeah, tier one assets that they are the highest quality of assets, you know, probably and I don't think there's an official definition of this. But in my mind, I would say they're the top 25 percent and the cost curve are the lowest 25 percent in the cost curve, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, but they are the ones that are going to make money pretty much no matter what. You've got a couple of those in Canada. You've got a couple in Australia. rest of them are probably in Kazakhstan. So in the Western world, you probably have four, maybe five tier one and, and uh, you know, outside of Kazakhstan. But you know, going to the time it's going to take to backfill that supply and, and grow that supply, every nation has its own regulatory regime. But by and large, you have to discover the deposit first, obviously. That doesn't happen overnight. That can take many, many years. But let's assume for the sake of argument that a deposit is known. Before you can go into production, first thing you have to do is you have to collect baseline environmental data. That is true around the world. Uh, I can't think of any exceptions to that. That's going to take a year maybe as long as two years, depending on the uh, jurisdiction to, to be able to do that. Once you have that, you write up your application to supply to the uh, appropriate government agencies. You give it to them to review. And I would say the best case for regulatory review is three years. And that's exceptional. I know of cases where uh, projects have been in permitting for pushing 14 years now and uh, there's no end in sight. Uh, so for there, for permitting, I won't use the extreme, but I'm gonna say it's gonna take three to five years uh, for most facilities to be permitted, but certainly it can take much longer than that. And then to build out and to ramp up, you're looking at another one to two years to be able to do that. So those numbers I gave you uh, on the low end, if everything goes extremely well, you're looking at uh, about five years, from the time you begin permitting to the time you can begin mining. On the uh, upper end, you're looking, let's see, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine years between the time you begin permitting to the time you can begin developing. So yeah, it's they are long lead items and certainly many of them are gonna take more than nine years. It might take yeah. 10 to 15 years. Which is a challenge in and of itself because you already have an investor community that's suffered from a previous market cycle. Now, we were arguing or you're arguing to some extent this is going to be different. But, you know, this isn't a sure bet either, right, for new projects as well for, for a variety of reasons. So it's definitely complex. And now, of course, we face, you know, 8% interest rates as well. So these hurdles are getting higher in some senses. They are. And, you know, it's it's worth commenting here on a couple of uh barriers to entry into the market manpower is a big issue in the western world uh, i certainly know it's been an issue in canada it's been an issue in the u.s including for my company uh, to be able to go out and get qualified manpower keep in mind this industry has been depressed for a number of years a lot of people have left the industry so uh, our technical experts have been decimated and they're just flat, not many people out there looking for work right now. Here in Wyoming, where I'm sitting today, our unemployment rate is right around 3%. So to go out and get employees to staff a mine, it's pretty challenging. 
Now, fortunately, we've been successful, but let me tell you, it took a long time and it took a lot of effort to get our miners. The, the other mm -hmm. uh, barrier to entry right now is simply supply chain. Uh, if you want to build out a new mine right now, the cost is dramatically higher than it's been in the past. And the time is also dramatically longer than in the past. And I, let me give you a perfect example. Uh, and these are numbers I, I live with every day. When we built out our Lost Creek mine back in 2012, it took us nine months to build out the processing plant. It's an in situ mine and it doesn't take long to build out. So we built out the full facility, had it up and running in nine months. Now we're looking at building out a smaller facility. It's a satellite facility. Uh, and it's going to take us, we believe, about two years to do that. Only six months of that two years is going to be the actual physical build out. The other 18 months is waiting on supply chain, motor control centers, transformers, industrial monitoring equipment like flow meters, pH meters, things like that. Uh, our vendors are telling us minimum of a year maybe in some cases as much as 18 months. And the bad news is they tell us the supply chain is not getting shorter, it's getting longer. So we're facing that reality here in the US and I believe it's being faced globally as well. So there are significant barriers to entry beyond just permitting. Uh, you have gotta get the manpower, you've gotta get the contractors, you've gotta get the supplies and it's a challenge. Yeah. And as you say as well, right, it's not just at the pithead expertise, it's actually across the board. You know, you've had a 20, 30 year absence of of people exiting the Colorado Mine School to go into this, mm -hmm. into uranium. And you, you, across the board, you, you lack some of that uh, that key expertise. And a lot of it, as you say, doesn't exist in the US anymore. Well, this is a good point to actually, um, I'd love to, I think we'd all like to hear a bit more about UR Energy or your energy and, and kind of the you know what your company is up to and and how i guess you're you're capitalizing on this opportunity that that does present more globally yeah no absolutely and fortunately those barriers to entry uh, my company uh, your energy we're we're beyond those to a large degree because our lost creek mine uh, it's been running here in wyoming for over 10 years even in the down market we continued to produce we sold into long term contracts for a long time and then uh, a little over a year ago, the market started to improve and we started to sign additional long term contracts with major global utilities and nuclear players. And so we've locked in some really good revenues for our company from production from Lost Creek that we intend to sell into those contracts. But that gave us the faith to begin to ramp production back up at our Lost Creek mine. And we are well into that now. Uh, it's been challenging with supply chain, with manpower, with weather. We typically don't face much bad weather where we work, but let me tell you the winter last year was, uh, I think apocalyptic is the right word. It was harsh and uh, so we suffered from that, but we're steadily getting beyond those uh, issues. Production is becoming uh, increasingly steady and improving. Um, and we've been very open about those challenges and uh, we're excited to be ramping that up and selling into contracts. Last year, revenue uh, was a little over 17 million from sales. This year, our contract book goes to 570,000 pounds of uranium. Uh, next year, 600,000. The two years after that, 700,000. And we still have a lot of room left in our contract book. In fact, about three quarters of our licensed capacity remains uh, to sell into contracts. So yeah, just the exciting time to be ramping that up. Our second mine will be Shirley Basin. We have not pulled the trigger on that to build it out yet. It is fully permitted, but as we sign more contracts, we hope to, to build that out and make a decision on that in the near term. We're well cashed up. End of last year, uh, we had nearly 60 million in cash, uh, around $5 million in debt. And uh, we've got some very sophisticated investors. More than half of our shares are institutional held by some of the smartest names out there in the uranium space. So yeah, well cashed up, ramping up to sell into those long-term contracts. We are very uniquely positioned as a publicly traded company uh, that's actually mining uranium. Uh, again, I, I'll use this analogy again, but I can count us all on one hand. And uh, that's true on uh, listing of public companies that are actively engaged in mining right now. It is a very 
very short list. So, but yeah, that's where we are, Paul. Fabulous. Well, I'll, I'll put links to the company in the show notes and, you know, stock ticker, URG and so forth. And well, especially, you know, I think for, from this side of point, you know, it's been a fascinating insight into the uranium space and kind of look forward to, to having you back on in a, a couple of years and, and get an update on where it is. Cause it's sort of, you know, there's, there's so much that's analogous to what's going on in other metals and other commodities and there's also this uniqueness of uranium itself and the history that it's had and its role in in global geopolitics so thanks john for a very clear exposition on it all right thanks paul it's been fun thank you for listening if you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show please give us a positive review on apple podcasts or spotify to find out more about hc insider and hc group a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.